Is lying evil? Nobody will deny that dishonesty is a vice, but many people in the modern day will claim that lying can sometimes be justified should the ends justify the means. The idea that lying is always wrong seems counterintuitive, they claim, because it would cause them to be unable to lie to protect themselves or others. Many Christians, such as the apologist Michael Jones from Inspiring Philosophy, argue for this position. However, this goes against some of the most intelligent men in human history, men as wise as Aristotle, St. Augustine, and St. Thomas Aquinas, all believed that it was always wrong to lie. In this video, I hope to illuminate why you ought to believe these great men when they say that lying is always wrong. To understand why lying is wrong, we must first understand how to judge whether a given action is right or wrong. According to the early Christian philosopher Dionysius the Areopagite, in order for an act to be moral, all three of its fonts, or elements, must be righteous. The three fonts of an act are its object, its end, and the circumstances surrounding the act. All three of these elements must be good, or at least morally neutral, for an act to be moral. The object of an act is what the exterior action is about, according to St. Thomas. This is determined by the very nature of the act. The object of an act answers the question, what happened? Oftentimes, we can tell whether an act is moral or not just by looking at its object. For example, Killing an innocent person is always wrong, even if one does so with the best of intentions, because the object of the act goes against mankind's social nature. Meanwhile, giving alms to a person in need has a good object. The end of an act is the agent's goal in doing the act. The end of the act answers the question, why was that act done? An otherwise good act can be made evil if the agent had evil intentions. For example, giving alms to a needy person is an act with a good object. However, if the end of the giving is to gain a favorable reputation, then the act becomes evil. Lastly, the circumstances around an act are the various particular traits that surround and are attached to the act. Learning these traits answers the questions who, what, where, how, when, and with whose help. The circumstances can change the morality of an action even if that act is good or neutral in object. For example, the act of firing a pistol is neutral in object. But, if circumstances happen to be that I'm firing a pistol into a crowded street, then the act becomes an immoral one even if I have the best of intentions in doing so. Again, all three of these fonts have to be good in order for the act to be moral. If even one of these is wrong, then the whole action is immoral. My thesis is that the very object of lying is wrong. This means that lying is always immoral no matter the intentions of the liar or the circumstances surrounding the act of lying. But that begs the question. What is lying? Lying is speech contrary to one's mind. Thomistic philosopher Edward Fazer clarifies that the speech must be, quote, unambiguously contrary to what one really thinks, end quote. This means that the liar must choose to clearly express an untruth. There are many reasons why ethicists claim that lying is always wrong. This video will briefly cover seven of these reasons. Number one, application of the golden rule. 
It is a universally recognized rule that you ought to do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Now, nobody wishes to be deceived. This means that lying is an evil no one wishes to suffer. Thus, lying is prohibited by the golden rule. Reason 2. Lying is harmful to society. Humans are social animals by nature. We are naturally given to living in societies. Thus, whatever tends to subvert human society is intrinsically wrong. But lying tends to do this by weakening mutual confidence, something essential to human society. Therefore, lying is intrinsically wrong. Reason number three, the perverted faculty argument. As Aristotle noted, the good of a thing consists primarily in its characteristic activity, that is, its purpose as determined by its nature or form. From this, it follows that it is intrinsically evil to use a thing contrary to its natural purpose. This follows from a scholastic understanding of the natural law, which I've defended on my blog. Now, the natural purpose of speech is to communicate our thoughts to our fellow men, meaning that speaking contrary to one's thoughts cannot possibly be good. But that is precisely what a lie is. Therefore, lying is intrinsically evil. Reason number four, truth cannot command untruth. This argument can be found in St. Augustine's essays on lying. If lying is sometimes good, then that would mean that it is true that lying is sometimes morally justified. In other words, truth would sometimes entail lying. But this is clearly ridiculous. A virtue cannot entail its opposite. Just as piety cannot entail that we should hate our parents or chastity entail that we should commit adultery, or justice entail that we should murder and steal, truth cannot entail that we ought to lie. Therefore, it is never true that lying is sometimes morally justified. Reason number five, lying dishonors the martyrs of the faith. If one can legitimately lie in order to save one's life, then the martyrs of the faith could have done so to save their own lives, Thus, they died unnecessarily and foolishly. However, if lying is evil, then the martyrs did not die foolishly, but died for the truth. This matches what scripture says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 5. A faith witness does not lie. Reason number six, the terrible theological consequences. If lying is morally legitimate, then God can lie. But if God can lie... That means he can go back on his word and thus does not have to honor any promises he makes to his believers. This would mean that our faith in God is not built on a firm foundation, but on a rug that he can flip over on us at any time. After all, who are we to demand something from God? This would also seem to go against the plain meaning of several passages in scripture. Finally, reason number seven, it goes against scripture. There are several passages in the Bible that show that God hates lying and liars. On screen are a sample of some of these verses. Pause and read them when you have the time. Now, before I continue, I must clarify my position. I do not believe that all lies are equally wrong. Depending on the end and circumstances of the lie, a lie might be either mortally sinful or merely venially sinful. For example, a lie told to harm another person is obviously not as bad as a lie told to save a life. Now, there are many types of acts that people confuse with lying. First and foremost is deception. We know that deception and lying are two different things because many kinds of deception do not involve lying executing a feint in a fight, a stratagem in warfare, or a deceptive move in a game are all examples of deception that do not necessarily count as lies. Some of them don't even involve using the speech act and are thus incapable of being lies. Those that do involve speech acts need not involve speaking contrary to one's mind. 
Certain social conventions can also be mistaken for lies. Phrases like, I'm doing fine, you look nice today, and other polite utterances are not meant to be taken as literal expressions of one's thoughts. Rather, they are pleasantries, turns of phrase whose purpose is to make a conversation friendlier and more enjoyable, allowing one to practice the virtue of niceness. Thus, saying, I'm doing fine, even when one is having a bad day, is not a lie. This also includes non-literal speech like idioms. For example, if a secretary picks up the phone and says her boss is not in yet, this is not a lie even if her boss is literally in the office. This is because the phrase, the boss is not in, is an idiom that means the boss can't pick up the phone right now, or something to that effect. Sometimes equivocation can be mistaken for lying. If one uses an expression with two meanings, then whether one's speech is truly contrary to one's thoughts is ambiguous. Making an assertion with two meanings, one true and one false, which the listener or reader could misunderstand, is an act of equivocation, not a lie. This is what Abraham told his wife to do in Genesis chapter 12, verse 13, when he told her to call herself his sister. The Hebrew word for sister often being used to denote a near female relative. Equivocation is not intrinsically wrong, but it ought not to be done lightly, else speech would become unreliable and harm social confidence. Finally, in the opinions of some, acting is a form of lying since the actors are pretending to be one thing but are actually something else. But the context of a play or a movie makes it clear that actors are not speaking their literal thoughts, but are simply playing a part. The actor's mind is preoccupied with telling a story, specifically the story of a play or movie that he stars in, by acting and speaking like one of the characters of that story. Only a very foolish person would believe that plays or movies are real. Thus, Acting is not a form of lying. Before we move on, it might be helpful to look at a couple of borderline examples to really hammer home this principle. We'll first start with jokes. Now, generally speaking, jokes are not lies for the same reason that pleasantries and other social conventions aren't lies, namely that they aren't meant to be taken literally. The immediate response to an outrageous falsehood told as a joke is, you're joking, right? Such a joke would only turn into a kind of lie, a jocose lie to be precise, and thus be immoral if there was nothing in the context of the statement that would indicate that it was just a joke. The other borderline case is mental reservation. Now, mental reservation is the act of withholding a qualifying phrase from a statement that is false if the phrase is withheld, but true if the phrase is not. This is because the unexpressed qualification affects or entirely alters the meaning of the statement as understood by the person addressed. For example, say a doctor was asked if he knew some confidential piece of information about a patient. If the doctor replied with, no, I'm not going to tell you, that would be a literal expression of his thoughts. If he replied with, no, I don't know, then that would be contrary to his thoughts, making it a lie. But if he replied with a simple no, with no qualifications, then would he be guilty of a lie? It is not obvious that he is. Now, there are two types of mental reservation. The first is a strict mental reservation, in which the qualification is strictly mental, i.e., when there is nothing either in the words or in the circumstances that can prevent the hearer from being deceived. This kind of mental reservation makes the statement's meaning an unambiguous falsehood, and thus a kind of lie. The second is broad mental reservation, in which the qualification is not strictly mental. This would make it similar to equivocation, an ambiguous form of speaking. Like equivocation, broad mental reservation ought not be done lightly, but it is not a lie. Deception, pleasantries, idioms, equivocation, broad mental reservation, jokes, acting, none of these can be called a lie. Keep in mind, though, 
that the end or circumstances of these actions can change the morality of the act, even if they have a good object. Now, the arguments against my thesis often use thought experiments and examples from history in order to refute it. The most famous of these is the murderer at the door thought experiment. You all know the one. A murderer comes to your door demanding to know where he can find his intended victim, who happens to be hiding in your home. Would it be wrong to lie to him to protect his intended victim? Our intuitions would say that lying to the murderer is justified. However, the construction of a moral thought experiment is not a reliable way of determining what is right and wrong precisely because this method relies on fallible moral intuitions. The thought experiment does nothing to address the reasons why lying is always wrong. And in the first place, there is no reason to tell the murderer at the door the truth. You could instead say nothing, attempt to distract him, use broad mental reservation to deceive him, threaten him, or even use violence against him to protect the one in your home. Another common sticking point against the thesis that lying is always wrong is the common cultural practice of lying to your child about Santa Claus. Surely there's nothing wrong with that, right? However, since it's always wrong to lie, lying to your children about Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, the Tooth Fairy, etc. must be at least a little wrong. To be clear, it is not seriously immoral given the ends parents generally have for this charade. However, it's unwise to purposefully set up your child to be disenchanted given the long-term negative consequences this could have on your child's faith life. A child that was fooled into thinking Santa Claus was real might grow up believing that their parents lied to him about other topics, like religion. When secular thought experiments fail, many proponents of lying turn to examples from the Bible. First among these is Jacob, quote-unquote, lying to Isaac in Genesis chapter 27, verse 19. However, when Jacob said he was Esau, he meant it in a mystical sense. By purchasing his older brother's primogeniture, Jacob had essentially taken his place in the family. Thus, he was justified in taking his name, too. St. Thomas Aquinas also adds that, quote, He made use of this mode of speech, being moved by the spirit of prophecy, in order to signify a mystery, namely that the younger people, i.e. the Gentiles, should supplant the firstborn, i.e. the Jews. Another example is found in Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. Now, it's unclear from the passage alone whether the midwives lied to the Pharaoh, but supposing they did, the passage makes clear that God did not reward them for their deception, but for the end of the deception, namely that they feared God. Another example is found in Joshua chapter 2, verses 2 through 6. This one was used by Protestant apologist Michael Jones of Inspiring Philosophy to argue for the moral justness of lying. This incident is similar to the example with the midwives, the only difference being that we know from the passage that Rahab lied. Again, God rewarded Rahab's good intentions, not her lie. You can see this argument found in St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa. Oftentimes, people claim that Samuel lied to the elders in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1-13. through 13. However, the context makes it clear that he did not lie. He did actually come to make a sacrifice as the Lord commanded. He simply omitted some other details, namely that he was also there to anoint David as the new king over Israel. This is an example of deception, not lying. Another example, this one also used by Michael Jones, is Jeremiah chapter 38, verses 24 through 27. The context makes it clear that what Jeremiah said wasn't a lie, because just earlier in that chapter, Jeremiah had pleaded to the king to help him avoid death. King Zedekiah then instructed Jeremiah to leave out some of the details of their conversation. Again, this is an example of deception, not lying. Our final example of quote-unquote lying that we find in Scripture is John chapter 7, verses 8 through 10, where our Lord supposedly lied to his brothers. 
Our Lord's brothers wanted to make a spectacle of his appearance, but making such a spectacle would have attracted the wrong kind of attention and led to Jesus' death. Had Christ made a spectacle according to the time of his brothers, it would have ruined the Father's plans for salvation. This is what Jesus meant when he told his brothers that his time had not fully come. This is an example of broad mental reservation, not lying. In conclusion, lying is always wrong because it undermines social trust, opposes the virtue of truth, and is contrary to both natural law and the Holy Scripture. While it may be tempting to tell a lie in order to get out of a difficult situation, the long-term cost of lying is always greater than the short-term benefit. For scenarios like the murderer at the door, there is always a way out for those who love the truth. It is important, then, to recognize the power of our words and to choose honesty and truth in all of our interactions. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thank you, and have a nice day.